Here's the deal. So let's say that you want to compare the motions of two different planets. Okay? So this is like one of the problems. So let's say that here is a star. Call that alpha. Okay? Whatever. And you have two planets that are orbiting. Planet number one, planet number two. Okay? So as the story goes, and you got to remember that Newton did his work after Kepler's works were published, and actually after Kepler passed away. So as the story goes, and this is what I like about science, is it, it, is, it is full of like little anecdotal stories. So a guy comes up to Newton and says, you know, we can't figure out how to explain Kepler's laws in terms of gravity. And according to the legend, Newton goes, well, I've had that worked out. And he pulls out this drawer, and there's some papers in there, and the guy goes, this is why they work. And the guy's flipping out, going, well, why didn't you have this published? I mean, everybody's trying to make these work. And, and, and Newton goes, it's not that big a deal. Here it is. So this is the short version of what Kepler laid out. Or excuse me, what Newton laid out to explain <laughs> So we're going to compare the ratio of the period of planet 2 to the period of planet 1. So this whole thing starts off with that Swiss Army knife equation. 4 pi squared r cubed equals big G mass of whatever you're orbiting, which in this case is going to be the mass of the planet alpha, and T squared. Okay. And remember, that mass, listen to me, listen to me very carefully, that mass is what is at the center of the orbit. It is not what is orbiting. It's not the satellite, it's not the spaceship, whatever it is. It's whatever is at the center of the orbit because the assumption is, is that the gravitational force between that planet and the Earth or between that planet and the spaceship or whatever it is is what's creating the centripetal force, okay? It's called a simple two-body calculation. It gets infinitely more complicated if you have a whole dynamics of other planets, but we're just going to treat it as what's called a two-body system. So let's say that I want to look at and just calculate the period of planet 2, okay? So why is the period of planet 2 going to be bigger than the period of planet 1? Because it's farther away. It's farther out. So number one, it has a greater distance to travel in that orbit, okay, and it's going slower, okay? So the period of planet two, if I were to solve for that, is going to be four pi squared r cubed over big G times the mass of planet, or the star alpha, and this is going to be the radius of 2. Okay, so all I did was solve for, I've got this period of planet 2 squared is going to equal 4 pi squared r cubed over big G times the mass of alpha. Okay, all I did was solve for period. I didn't, I'm not going to do the square root, and you'll see why in just a second. Okay, everybody cool with this? Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to work this, that squared, as a ratio. Now, I'm going to compare that to the period of planet 1. So the period of planet 1 squared is going to equal 4 pi squared times the radius of planet 1 cubed over big G mass of the star. So what's going to happen? What can we cancel out? 4 pi squared and 4 pi squared. Big G mass alpha, big G mass alpha. Guess what? We get the period of planet 2 squared over the period of planet 1 squared equals the radius of planet 2 cubed over the radius of planet 1 Kepler's third law. Otherwise known as Kepler's third, Kepler's third law. So Newton comes along and he says, this is what works. Okay. 
because it's just a ratio. If you set it up as a ratio of periods, everything cancels out. Here you go. But, 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 this only works if those masses are the same. Because that's the only way it can cancel out. That's why you can only use Kepler's third law with objects that orbit the same center. Okay? Because if they don't, your masses don't cancel out. Okay? So that's why you can compare Earth and Mars. It's cool. But you can't compare Earth and a, a moon of Jupiter. Because the moon of Jupiter is orbiting Jupiter, we're orbiting the Sun. Okay? So that's why you can't do that. So Newton basically says, this is why it works. Here you go. You know, not a big deal. You just set them up. It's ratio. So if you want to compare the mass of stars, okay? So let's say, for example, you want to look at two different stars. So basically, you're going to go back, and you're going to start with the Swiss Army knife, a 4 pi squared r cubed equaling g mass of the sun times t squared. So if you solve for the mass of the sun that's at the orbit, so it's going to be the same idea. So the mass of star 1 is going to equal 4 pi squared, the radius of 1 cubed, divided by g times the period of 1 squared. And then we're going to divide that by m2, which is going to be 4 pi squared, r2 cubed, divided by big G, period of 2 squared. So again, what's going to happen? Big G's cancel. 4 pi, Four pi squared. squared is going to cancel, and G. G is going to cancel. Okay. So what we have is the mass of 1 over the mass of 2 is going to equal r1 cubed over t1 squared equals r2 cubed over t2 squared. So you can, you can set this up depending upon what you want to compare. you want to compare masses? Do you want to compare periods? Do you want to compare radius? Now, so here's the deal. So what I would do with this is that I would simplify this a little bit because of the fact that like, like that period two was going to flip up there. So you'd have R1 cubed times T2 squared over T1 squared times R2 cubed. Oh uh, yeah, times R2 Cubed. So there's one like that on, which one is that? It's 48. So if you look on that book problem on 48, what page is that on? Uh, now 186. One eighty six. Yeah, so on 48 it says, HD 10180G orbits with a period of 600 days at a distance of 1.480 from the star. What's the ratio of the star's mass to our sun's mass? Okay. So, again, what you're going to do, this is all about a ratio. So, you're trying to find this ratio. So, basically, once you get it like this, you're going to have four variables. You're going to have R1. And then you're going to have period one, and then you're going to have radius two, and you're going to have period two. If you're not sure, write these out. So in this case, you're going to have this planet, uh, HD. So call this HD, call this HD. Now, you're going to be talking about wh which planet do you want to use for our sun? Do you want to use Mercury? Do you want to use Venus? Do you want to use Earth? Which one do you want to use? Earth. Earth. Why? Because what? It's one of you. So this is going to be the radius of the Earth, and this is going to be the period of the Earth. Now, if you're going to let this be one AU, which you can, okay, and that's cool, 
mainly because of the fact that you're told that that other planet has is a radius of 1.4. So that planet is would be kind of almost comparable to like Mer to Mars's orbit, okay? So that's going to be 1.4. Now this is what you have to watch. You have to watch this. You have to watch this. You have to watch this. So you're told that that period is 600 days. So the period of this is going to be 600 days, okay? So what do you then do you have to use for the period of Earth? Days. You've got to use 365 days. Okay, now here's your other option. It, because it's a ratio, this is the cool thing because it's a ratio. You could let the period of the Earth be one year, but then what would you have to do with the 600 days? Divide, divide, that, by divide that by 365 to get that into years, okay, which would be a little bit one, one and some change, okay? So it, because this is the beauty of it, it's a ratio. Okay, so oddly enough, when you get down to 48 and you go through all this rigmarole, you should get an answer for about one. Exactly. Pretty close. Huh? About exactly. Pretty, pretty close, yeah. So what that means is that, and, and again, here's the deal. And, and, this, and this actually, the technology to look at expo, ex, what they call exoplanets is relatively new in the study of astronomy. Because it's, it's actually really, really difficult to do. So here's basically the simple technique that they, that they do. So this is why you have to have very, 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 very good telescopes. So you're looking at what? Don't let them do it. Decline it. Decline. Decline it. It'd be kind of funny. What, what, what sound do you think it is? Accept, accept, accept. No. Block, block him. Block him. Uh, just block him. Oh my oh, god, that was me. No, I'm playing. Block him. Jay. Oh, that's her. Okay. Oops. Block her. Sorry. Yeah, Not block her from the network. Okay. <laughs> Screw so, they don't even know. what they do is that so? they look at a star. And so imagine that you have light that you're looking at. Number one, it's a very, very distant light because you're looking at a star that's light years away. And what happens is that you would have a planet that would transit in front of it. So what happens is that when it would block it, block it, block it. Block it. Or, or accept it and just see what it is. Don't, no. don't accept it. Why? Block it. No. Oh! oh. That doesn't work. Those are the basics of oh. what we're going to focus on. What is ATP? You don't know what ATP is? Is, is that cells? <laughs> yeah. Isn't it like the, the, the power of the cells? The mitochondria is the power of the something triphosphate. How'd you oh, do that? Top right. Top right. Or right, screen off. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, source. It's source on the remote. Go get her, Bertrand. Hold on. You're good. If you had source on the remote, then you can redo it. It'll well, I, I, I'll I'll just technical difficulties will be back. We back. They're on the run. Okay. So what they would notice is that when that planet would transit in front of it, you would they would notice a very, 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 very slight dimming to the star. Okay, and it isn't like it's obvious where you, because we're so far away, we can't actually see the planet. But what we see is how much of that light gets dimmed out, and then we figure out, okay, well, obviously if it gets mm -hmm. dimmed a lot. The starburst thing or thunderbolt. Barge into their classroom and turn off their TV. <laughs> yeah, sort of like. <laughs> <laughs> Look something up. A -A. We'll be back. We'll be back. One. Equipment to notice the dimming of that star. But obviously, if it was a bigger planet, it would dim more. They would also get an idea of how long that transit took. How often was that star getting dimmed out by that planet? So, this is why, again, it took years and years and years. Like, let's say, for example, you're on a distant planet way, way, way on the other side of the, of, the, of the universe, and you're looking at the Earth, and you're looking at our star. Okay, look at the Earth. How often would you see the Earth 
dim in front of that star if you're looking at it. 365. Yeah. Oh my god. I think we're just going to have to deal with it. No. I'm not, I, yeah, I can't deal with that. And it's probably louder up there, so. Oh, oh. All right, stop. Okay. So, let's talk about question 42. Okay? Because I like question 42. So, on question, this is the one out of the book, obviously. So, if you look at the information that you are given on this one. Yeah, I think we're just going to have no, no, I'm not going to deal with that. It's biology. He's being no biology. It's not a real science, huh, Burkett? <laughs> I don't know if I screwed this up or if you Okay. Did. So, if you look on 42, so you got planet X orbits the star Omega. So, here is planet X. And it's the same thing on and a year that's 200 years long. Yeah. And I and I taught I taught both of her sons, so I have sympathy for her. So and then planet Y circles somewhere out here, and that distance is four times greater. Okay. 200 days. 200 days. Huh? It's 200, 200 days. days. 200 days. No, 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 I did the same That'd thing. Be yeah. I imagine. Yeah. I did the same 200 days. Still going to be the same ratio. So here's the deal. So go to that Swiss Army knife equation and go, okay, so the period of y is going to equal the square root of 4 pi squared radius of y cubed over big G mass of that star. And that's going to be divided by Tx, 4 pi squared, x cubed over big G mass alpha. Okay? So now, that's how you can start this out. Well, conveniently, look at, again, what's going to cancel out? Oh, you're going to lose the 4 pi squared. You're going to lose the G. Okay? And then... If you square both sides back, and you get ty squared over tx squared equals ry cubed over rx cubed. And you're just back to Kepler's third law of motion. So what you should see, and if you look at this in terms of like the squares and cube thing, you should get an answer of about 1,600 days. Which one? That's 42? That's 42. What if I did it in seconds? Don't. Don't. <laughs> How do you do not give me 1,600 days in seconds. How do I? Okay. Multiply by 3,600. No, you divide by 3,600. Do not give me that answer in seconds. 3,600 is an hour divided by 24 hours. Yes. Yeah. That's the beauty of working these as ratios. Yeah, well, <coughs> yeah. That's a lot of seconds. That's a lot of seconds. Okay. So let's talk about question 57. Let's talk about that. Okay. So let me kind of give you a visual on this. So you got this thing going around in a circular conic section like this. Now, as this thing is going around, what are the actual forces acting on that stop? There's actually there's two forces. Gravity, and the gravity. gravity and the tension. tension. That's it. That's it. There's gravity and tension. That's it. That is it. So if you look at this, wait, is tension different from centripetal? Oh no, ten, isn't tension what? We'll, we'll, we'll get there. Just chill out. Hold on. That's what causes it. Though. We'll get there. Yeah. Centripetal force. So, yeah. you have the gravitational force acting down, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have the tension from... Oh, you've got to use sine, cosine, stuff. Ah, there you go. That's not even okay? Right. Now, so, <laughs> by the way, here's the magic code. Yeah, when I, I say I really like a problem, let me give you a hint. Really bad. Well, no, no, you're really likely to see that question on the test. Oh. Okay, so hint, hint. 
you're very likely to see this question on the test. Oh. Okay. I don't like that. Sorry. I, hey, at least I'm telling you. Yeah, at least I'm telling you. Yeah, actually, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I actually do kind of make the rules. So, yeah. That's, that's why I like teaching. Uh, so, here's the deal. So, just think this through. The mass of this thing is 500 grams, right? So, just start with the basics. What's the downward pull of gravity on a 500 gram mass? 4.9. 4.9 newtons, right? Yeah. Okay. So, imagine this. You're out here like this. There's a 4.9 newton force acting down like this. So what does that mean? There has to be a 4.9 newton force acting upward. straight up. Now, if the string, this is, why you, this is why we studied vectors first. If the string was just straight up like this, 4.9, 4.9, right? Yeah. But now this is out like this. Ooh. So is the tension in that string going to be bigger or smaller than 4.9? Greater. Bigger. Potent. So it's like holding your arm out like this, lifting something. Yes. Okay? So here's what's going to be important. This side of this triangle over here is 4.9 newtons. Okay? That's going to be 4.9 newtons because that has to balance out the gravitation. The tension isn't 4.9. The vertical component is 4.9. Now, they also tell you on this one that it's moving in a horizontal circle with, with radius of 20 centimeters. So this is 20 centimeters. And the length of the string is what, one meter? Okay. So knowing that the string is one meter and this radius is 20 centimeters, what can you find? What'd you say? You can find the angle, okay? Because you know two sides of the triangle. You know the hypotenuse and you know the side. <coughs> so if you do that and you work that out, you get an angle of 78 and a half degrees, okay? Now, what you ultimately want to find in this problem is the tension in the string. So what I did when I worked this, because I don't like working off this angle. For me, it's always easier to work off this angle out here. Okay, Louis. Uh, why does it not matter that both of the components are not the same unit? Well, you, but yeah, you'd have to put this in meters. You got to put that as 0.2 meters. Okay. Okay. I think that's assumed, Louis. Well, yeah. no, because one's Newton and one's. <coughs> no, 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 no. You can only. Louis got a valid point. This angle can only be found either as a ratio of forces or a ratio of distances. I can't use like 4.9 newtons and 0.2 meters. Yeah, okay. I either work off forces to find the angle or I work off distances to find the angle. Okay, how do you know the distance of that 4.9 then? Because I don't know that distance. I don't care about this. I know that's the magnitude of it. Uh -huh. I know the direction that it's pointing straight up because it's balancing out that gravitational force. Okay. I'm going to use these two distances of one meter and 0.2 meters oh, to find it, that angle. It gives you the one meter on the... Yes. Bonus. Okay, I thought you were using a 4.9. No, 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 no. It tells me the length of that string is one meter. Okay. That makes sense. Okay? Yeah. That's where I got that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why I'm going to use these distances to find the angle. Mm -hmm. But then when I get the angle, then I'm going to, I'm going to use that to work out the force side of it, gotcha. okay? So then I'm gonna know this angle, I'm gonna know this vertical component here, I'm trying to find that tension. So that answer, this tension has to be bigger than 4.9, okay? So, what does, does that, that wasn't the bug. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It's back in its cuff, don't worry, it's fine. What, did you try and escape? Yeah, you knocked the cup over. Yeah. Really? The tough button. to do inside a cup. Why do you have a like, button? Push it against the Push it against the Well, if you jump against that hard enough, well, you okay. <laughs> So anyway, so what you should see is that tension is 5 newtons. Okay? It's not a lot more because it's a pretty shallow anger, angle or anger, whatever. Now, the trick to this is the ball speed. So to do that, you've got to go, oh, well, centripetal force equals mv squared over r. 
Now, the trick is you don't know the centripetal force. But, but, which of these three sides, the vertical component, the tension, or that part of the triangle up there is going to represent the centripetal force? X component. Yeah, the X component is going to represent the <coughs> centripetal force. Thank you. <coughs> if you think about it, that makes sense. <coughs> because if it's just hanging straight down. It's the water. Oh, I need a lot of things. If it's hanging straight down, what does the centripetal force equal? 4.9. 4 .9. 4 .9. Zero. 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 There is no centripetal force. Okay, it was a trick question. Okay? <laughs> now, obviously, as it goes faster and faster and faster, what's going to happen to the centripetal force? It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, if I go completely horizontal, then the centripetal force is equal to the Tax tension. Okay? So you go from no centripetal force, like this, to full, full centripetal force. Okay? Got that? It's like got full attack centripetal of the killer force to the face. Uh, now, this is a classic example of, uh, I think the answer in the book on 57C is some weird deal. Like they give it in like omega radians or something, some weird deal like that. So, isn't it in anyway? Seconds? So, it, it, I think I think that answer in the back of the book is just weird. So, basically, here's what you're going to do you're going to use that to find the velocity, and then once you get the velocity, that's 2 pi r over t. So, I promise you, you mark my words. You're going to see a question like 57 on the test tomorrow. You mark my words, okay? Wait, so why are you going to 2 pi r over yeah. t? Because it, on... You have to find the period? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. That's why. Yeah, I was like, why are you going to... Yeah. Or you can go centripetal force equals mass 4 pi squared r over t squared, or you can yeah. do that. Okay, okay so... Oh, no. When you... So you're trying to solve for velocity, right? Yes. Okay. And you, so you find the triangle to find the centripetal. Right? Yeah, so you find okay. this side of the triangle up here. First, and then go into the equation. And then set that to this. Gotcha. You find the wall. And you got the mass of the stopper. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you're using that radius of 0.2 meters here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then solve for that velocity. Gotcha. Okay. So that velocity, uh, and I can, uh, there's something jacked up. Oh, it's it's on B. They give you that. They give you an answer. I think on B in like revolutions per minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what's jacked up. C is fine. Okay, yeah, B easy. should be point six. Should be your answer to B in meters per second is around point six. Okay, but yeah, they give you some weird jacked up. That's the one that's weird. So so you, so you want it in meters per second, not revolutions per minute. Yeah, yeah. On the test, I'm going to want that in meters per second. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to want that in meters per second without fail. So anyway, so make sure, make sure, make sure you can work that problem. Uh, let me see. Uh, on 77, let's talk about 77. So there's, there's some very critical information on 47 that's, that I need to stress. 77. So what space was So the 76 or 79 all deal with the same information. So the whole key to this is that you're told that it orbits at a very low circular orbit. So in other words, this thing is just basically right at the surface of the planet. And you can do that with objects that, or planets that don't have atmospheres. The only reason we orbit things in space is because we have an atmosphere. And again, on a relative size of the scale, our atmosphere would be about a half an inch thick. Okay, That's, that's all the thicker our atmosphere is. That's the only thing that allows us to survive. It's, it's been said that the only thing that humans being have that protects us from space is about a very thin atmosphere and about six inches of topsoil. And if we lose either one of those, we're screwed. Okay? Unless 
it's the reality of it. Right, so that the ground helps too? No, no, in terms of us being able to grow food. Oh, okay. So what we, our existence is based upon six inches of topsoil and a thin layer of gas. We, we ruin either one of those, we're dead. We're screwed. Yeah. Mars. Especially the atmosphere. Ah, oh, just nuke, the, okay. nuke Mars will be fine. So, the <laughs> Mars is working now. <laughs> so, here's the deal. So, think about this. Let's say that I'm going to take this apple and I'm going to throw it like that in an arc. Okay? Does it undergo centripetal acceleration? Yes? How do you know? There's gravity. It travels in an arc, right? So, if you go back to the idea that if you were to calculate the minimum velocity of something to complete a loop, so your force total equals force centripetal minus Fg. And if you're in a state of weightlessness, force total goes to zero. zero. So you have Fc equals Fg. And you have mv squared over r equals mass cancels out. You get v equals the square root of dirt. So that's exactly what's happening when something's in a near Earth, in an orbit very, very close to the surface. So what are you going to use for that radius? The radius of what? The radius of that moon or the yeah. radius of that planet. Okay? So as but that only works if you're in something in a very near Earth orbit. Okay, very close to the surface. Okay? So because obviously as you go farther out, what happens to your value of G? If, you, if you're way out here, yeah, it still works. You just can't use normal gravitational acceleration. It still works. You just have to use the gravitational acceleration at that point. Okay? So, but because of the fact that you're told that it's orbiting very close to the surface, you can use that 1.6 meters per second squared as the value of g. So that's the subtle thing that plays into this statement, okay? Because of the fact that you are in very close to the surface, that's where you get that value of g, okay? So obviously, let's say, for example, you know, we talked about uh, geosynchronous orbits. So here's a satellite way out here in that geosynchronous orbit. G obviously out here is going to be much, much less than 9.8 meters per second squared. So to calculate the velocity of an orbital satellite out here, I can't use 9.8 meters per second squared because it's not. It's a lot less than that. Okay. Now, if I knew what the gravitational acceleration is at that point, I could use that equation. So if I said, hey, on a geosynchronous satellite, G is 0.2, and the orbital radius is something times 10 to the 7th, whatever that is. Hey, what's the velocity? So if you had that information, you could use that. So that's just the trick on, seven, on question 77, where it says, how fast is this spacecraft moving? You're just going to use V equals the square root of GER. Okay? But you can only do that if you, it's because they didn't tell you how far it was. You could just assume that G is that centripetal acceleration because that's what's causing it and you can just use that equation. So there's that. Because that, that then forms the basis of the next kind of couple of questions. <coughs> okay, are we good with those? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so let's talk about this question with the Lagrange points on number seven. Yeah. So uh, Louis was Louis had some questions on that. Sorry, man. Oh, Where's my eraser going? It's all good. I lost my eraser. This is a bad deal. Hey, Steeler. What? You pop Thief. take it? You, of course he did. I was did. literally just messing with you. Though. You've had that eraser for like the whole entire school year. I know because I'm 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 a tidy person. Okay. 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 How about that eraser? Awkward. <laughs> Awkward. Up, Very awkward. Shut up, Vito. Shut up, Vito. Go play with Very your ruler. Very awkward. Pause. Mm. 
I actually got the right answer. Mm. How do you know what? To the wrong question. <laughs> okay, so if you look at what happens, like when, we're, when we go, when we went to the moon and the Apollo missions, first one to actually go to the moon was Apollo 8. They didn't land on the moon, they just went there. So they just basically wanted to prove that we could get to the moon. So Apollo 8, boom, sends them, they go. Now, here's the problem. You look at this and you think, oh, you're going to the moon. Moon stationary. What's the problem? It's not. Mm -hmm. It's not. No. Moon's moving like this. Now, speaking of the movement of the moon, we tend to draw this as saying, oh, here's the Earth and the moon goes around like that. That really isn't true, okay? And I'll show you why. So, Louis, come up here. I need to help. Okay. So, as many as I need, Louis. You're, you're going to represent the moon. Okay. I'm going to just hold it up. Okay. Now, the moon is said to be tidally locked to the Earth. So what that means is that the same side of the moon is always facing us. So I'm the Earth. Okay. I'm, it takes me 24 hours to spin on my axis, right? Okay. You're the moon. So you go around me. But when you go, this always has to point towards me. Okay. So, I, right now, this is a stationary thing. So, Louis is going around me, but he's always got the same side facing me. Now, here's the cool thing. The same amount of time it takes for Louis to go all the way around is the same amount it takes for him to spin on its axis. Okay? Because if you think about it, he, you're here, right? And if you were like to spin, you'd go like this, right? And eventually, you'd be facing this direction, and then you're going to be back towards me, right? So, go around like that, but you always have to face me. So, as I'm spinning on my axis, now, at this point, Louis is facing the opposite direction that he was here. So, he's rotated halfway through his mm -hmm. orbit, right? Now, when you get over here, spin, okay? Spin. Yeah, so he's spinning and moving at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, the cool thing about when we went to the moon and the Apollo missions, that was the first time anyone had ever seen the opposite side of the moon, okay? Not necessarily the dark side of the moon, but so there was a side of the moon that no human being had ever seen until we went around the back side of the moon because we're always looking at the front side. Okay, now, so here's what's gonna happen. I'm the Earth, right? You're the moon. Now, if I'm, if I'm not moving, it's very easy for you to go around me, right? Yes. But now I'm gonna start to move, okay? Uh -oh. So I want you to try and do what you just did and go around me, okay? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be moving, right? So what's gonna happen? You're gonna have to speed up quite a bit. Now what's gonna have to happen? Then you have to slow down, then what's gonna happen? Okay? Right? So that's getting complicated, okay? So all right, we're good. All right. So when I draw that as saying, oh, it's pretty simple, no, we'll just draw it like it's a stationary object. It's not, but here's the cool thing. So, here's the Earth. Actually, there's the Sun. Here's the Earth. How long does it take for the Earth to go once around in its orbit? So that's about 360 degrees, right? Yes. So we move about a degree a day. Yeah. Okay, if you think about it, we move about a degree a day as we go around the sun, okay? So, let's say that we're going to start with a full moon, okay? So, the full moon, the moon's going to be over here on the opposite side, right? Now, how long does it take for the moon to complete one cycle? One day. To go back to a full moon? 28 days. Oh. About 28 days, okay? Let's make it easy. Let's say it's 30. It's actually, well, let's do 28 Okay, so 28, in 28 days, the Earth is going to move, wait for it, 28 degrees. Okay, so now the Earth is going to be over here, 
True? Yeah. Cool with this. Moon has to be out there. Now, in between, we have a new moon. So, when we, so where is the moon when we have a new moon? Uh, in the way of the sun. Yeah. So on day 14, here's the earth. The moon's going to be here. So the moon actually travels sine waves. God dang it. I hate sine waves. No more waves. Stop with the sine waves. Wave wave. Okay. So it doesn't, it, everybody draws it like a stationary earth. And it's called, in, in the frame of reference of the earth, it does look like we're stationary. And we can draw it as going around like that. It works within our frame of reference. But if you look outside that frame of reference, the moon is actually has to be traveling because it's moving with us. Now, here's the bigger thing. We say that the moon, we say that the moon orbits the Earth. In reality, the moon is actually orbiting the sun, and we're just dragging, and it's just dragging along with us. Okay? Because remember, we did like a center mass. Well, we haven't done center mass calculations, but we will. The center mass of the system, the Earth-Moon system, is actually within the Earth itself. So it's like on a balance beam, if you were to take the Earth and the Moon, the center mass of that system is actually within the Earth. And that's actually what we orbit around. So the Moon is more accurately to say that it orbits the Sun, because that's actually, it's going to take the same amount of time, 365 days, for it to go around, just like it takes the Earth. So we say it orbits us, but in reality it doesn't. Okay, so let's go back to the to the Lagrange points. Okay. Oh, that's what we're saying. Thank you. Okay. That's I what we're saying. I don't like that. Huh? I don't like that. What? That's that's really hard I, to wrap I like my to head stick around. To yeah. the circles. You want to stick with the circles? Yeah. I'll stick. Okay. That's that's blasphemy, Mr. Burton. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fine. It's blasphemy. Sure. It's blasphemy. Oh, yeah. Vitor's still processing. Yeah. Vitor's still going. What is bleach? What I thought the moon was made of cheese. <laughs> okay. This is so, <laughs> here's the Earth. Here's the moon. So, we orbit the lunar command module orbits the Earth a couple times, makes sure everything's cool, okay? Then they fire their engines, and we begin to drift towards the moon. Now, if you were to look at a graph... And this is distance to moon. So here's zero. That's when we're at the Earth. And here's the distance to the moon. And you were to draw a graph of force between the lunar command module and the Earth. Just go down. Right? What would that look like? Linear going down. Well, it's actually going to be a quadratic because you're divided because... That force is going to be F equals big G, mass of the Earth, mass of the lunar command module divided by distance squared. Okay? So it's inverse. Yeah. So, well, but here's the point. Where is it going to start off as a maximum? Earth. Right there, right? And as you go away, it's going to decrease. decrease. It's going to become smaller and smaller and smaller. Decay. Right? Go with that. Now, if you were to draw another graph... And now we're going to draw the force between the moon and the lunar command module. What's that going to look like? The opposite. Opposite. So it's going to start off not at zero, okay? Ooh. Pretty close. Yes. Right? And it's going to go... Whoop. So at that point where it crosses, it's like a tug of war. So at that point, the pole between the moon and the lunar command module is going to equal the pole between the Earth and the lunar, lunar command module. So, it's, oh, so, it's just so like that's the branch point one. Okay. okay? So, or if you like pictures, so here's the Earth's gravitational well, there's the moon's gravitational well. The branch point one is going to correspond with the ridge of that of that space-time curvature. Yes. Okay? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. 
<laughs> well, I was, no, no, I understand what that curve, like, how that the curve means. Yeah, so here, here's the, here's the curve that's caused yeah, by the yeah. Earth. Yeah, yeah. Here, what's the curve that's caused by the moon. Okay? Yeah. So that's what we showed yesterday. Mm -hmm. Right? Cool with that. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So, mathematically, what we did is that we said these two forces are going to equal each other. Now, prior to... Crossing this point, what's the which would be the dominant force? Earth. The force Earth. towards the moon or the force towards the moon? Earth. 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 <coughs> then you're going to cross the Lagrange point. It's going to be the same. After you cross that Lagrange point, then the net force points towards the moon. moon. Now, after you cross that point, does that mean that the force between the lunar command module and the moon, excuse me, between the lunar command module and the Earth, goes to zero? No. No. It just means that the force towards the moon is like a tug of war. Then that becomes bigger. Okay? So, uh, this is what we went through yesterday. We said, okay, that force is going to equal big G, mass of the Earth, mass of the lunar command module, divided by that distance, which we don't know, squared. And that's going to equal big G, mass of the moon, Mass and lunar command module, and then that whole distance, three point is it three point eight four four? Something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it's times ten to the eighth minus x Square. quantity squared. So again, the big G is going to cancel out. The mass of lunar command module is going to cancel out, and this is why. Then that's when you go through that whole process and you cross multiply. Okay. So this is how you get your two roots. So basically, what's going to happen is that here's the Earth, here's the Moon. So the Grange point one is here. So what that means is if you could somehow just take a spaceship and put it right there in this gap and just stop it right there, you would it would stay there. It would be in a complete orbit. Because it's going to, it's, but you'd have to have it moving, okay? So you'd, you'd have to have it moving at the same speed that the Earth, that the Moon is moving. But if you could get it moving and put it right there, you could let go of it and it would stay completely locked in place, okay? You wouldn't have to fire the engines because it's going to be pulled equally, but its inertia is going to keep it moving just like it keeps the Moon moving, okay? Now, the second Lagrange point is out here, okay? So the second yeah, Lagrange really point sense. to push you on the other okay. side of the moon. But again, it would be the same idea. If you could get this thing going fast enough and stop it in that orbit, this is the Lagrange point, point two. two. So then yeah, it would move. So now what's happening, it's pulled towards the moon, but it's also pulled, pulled towards the earth. So though instead of being in a tug of war, they're both gravitational fields are going to be pulling it in this direction. Oh, keeping it in an orbit? Yes. Uh, okay. Keeping it in an orbit. So this is a tug of war that's keeping it in, in an orbit. This one out here is just going to be providing that, centri that centripetal force so that as the moon goes like this, it's going to go just around like that. So that's what we did with, that's what we did with the uh, James Webb telescope. That's actually parked in a Lagrange point relative to the sun Earth distance. Okay? So that's parked out there because of the fact that those two, that gravitational field, is just keeping it moving. And because it's on the other side of the Earth, we can put that in the shadow of the Earth. Because that, that James Webb telescope is picking up infrared. So it has to be really, 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 really cold so that its own heat signature doesn't interfere with the infrared signals it's getting from space. So that's why we parked it out there. So it's like in this really, 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 really cold, dark parking lot. Talk to me, Pop. What happens whenever another planet comes by then? Usually it's far enough away that it's not it going to disturb it. But like I said, the, oh, this, like this the, is yeah, simple yeah, because this is, like a, this is just like what we call a two-body system. Where it gets real ugly, it's like, yes, you get Mars pulling out here, and then Mars, when you know, if that lines up, then that's going to create a certain gravitational pull. So that's why we simplified this and we just make it what's called a two body system. What if Mars is still in the red? 
Huh? What if Mars is still on Earth? Like, like we, we, we'd be screwed. Okay. Is it possible? Would it would is, it possible? Would it is it possible? What would it do to us? Well, if we didn't have the moon, no tides. You would have no tides. But that, that's not that big. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. The, is actually, it? one of the things they think that life evolved here is because of the tides. Because having the tides, you had all you always had this exchange of water, of nutrients in the shallows. And without that, they don't think evolution would have occurred as rapidly because the, you wouldn't have like this basically perfect system. Speaking of planets, uh, NASA just came out yesterday and said that, you know, they thought, well, if you look at the billions upon billions of stars, they figured, hey, odds are there's going to be another planet just like us in what they called it the Goldilocks zone, okay? Not too close, not too far away. Well, one of the things that they studied was dwarf stars, okay? And there's a lot of, there's a lot of dwarf stars in, in, in our solar system. Dwarf stars tend to be smaller and... In our solar cold. system? No, no, not in our solar system. In, in the universe, yeah. this case, or in the Milky Way galaxy, okay? So what they thought was that because it isn't so hot, you'd have more of a tolerance to be in the Goldilocks zone. So they, they started studying planets that were close enough to have liquid water, so they would be warm enough to have liquid water, but not so far away that all the water would be frozen. But here becomes the catch-22. These dwarf planets emit tremendously strong magnetic fields, <coughs> excuse me, magnetic fields, and those magnetic fields, for the planet to have the correct radius to be in the Goldilocks zone, would put it in such an intense magnetic field that if it did have an atmosphere, the magnetic field would blow the atmosphere off and it wouldn't have an atmosphere. And so basically they said, well, so much for that idea. So literally that drastically reduced the number of planets they thought where you could, you know, could be in this Goldilocks zone where maybe life evolved or whatever. And so unfortunately what we're finding is that more and more like we are the very, 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 very much the exception. I mean, look at our own solar system. Mercury and Venus, they're a train wreck, okay? Literally talk about a hot mess, okay? You have those two, right? And you got Mercury, that's a cold mess without an atmosphere, excuse me, Mars, okay? And it says, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll establish a colony on Mars. Here's the problem, Mars doesn't have an atmosphere, okay? It, that, it does, it has like 0.1% of the atmosphere that we have. Everybody says, oh, we'll just grow plants and it'll release oxygen and we'll have an atmosphere. Okay, gravitational acceleration on Mars is about 3.1, okay? About a third of what it is here, okay? You have to have a gravitational field to hold an atmosphere. Okay, well that's problem number one. It doesn't have a really, really strong gravitational field. Problem number two, Mercury doesn't have a magnetic field like we do. Okay? Mars. Without a magnetic field. Mars. Mars doesn't have a magnetic field like we do. It's got too many amps floating around in my head. Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. So even if we could get an atmosphere, as soon as you get any kind of large solar ejection from the sun of ionized particles, it's done. It's just going to blow away. Okay? It's just going to be like a pile of sand in a big ocean tide, and it's just going to be gone because we don't have any, there's nothing to protect it. So, a former student of mine, Michael Staub, works for uh, Jet, Jet Propulsion Lab, and now he's working on the missions to go to the moon. And I asked him, I said, what are the odds of colonizing Mars? He goes, zero. It was not going to happen. Okay, it's not going to happen. Elon Musk In terms of happen. having an atmosphere, okay? Well, you could, yeah, because you can still technically live there, but you wouldn't have any kind of... Yeah, you could have like a small Colony. encapsulated, but as far as like having like an actual atmosphere with oh. weather and that type of thing, no bueno. No. Would that be on the surface or would that be underground? Would it matter? Uh, in terms of what? Like if Just you were using the crust the of the Mars as that. You could use that as quote an atmosphere, but mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> then, then, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just hollow, um, hollow it out. Now, uh, let's talk about, uh, this is off the, gnomes, <laughs> the uh, sheet that I gave you, and let's talk about question number 12, because I want to make sure everybody's cool 
with that question because you're likely to see something like that on the test tomorrow. Yeah, that was light work. I'm just oh, telling you. Light work. That was light work. Light work. So here's the deal. I, I did it. So here's the planet. Here's the satellites moving around like this, this, right? This one was easy. And it has some speed V. And and again, this this freaks people out like, oh, it's V. Who cares? Oh, it's just a V. Okay? And it has mass M. Okay? V tor. Has has velocity V tor. Okay? Vector. And vector vector V tor. So if the planet had half as much mass. The, the orbital of the speed would be blank. Express your answer as a multiple of v. Now, here's the deal. How do you calculate? What do you use to calculate the velocity of an orbital satellite? V equals what? The square root of gm over r. Big gm over r. Yeah. Okay. Cool with this. Do this. Cool. Now, assuming that the radius stays the same. The mass of the planet is going to become half as much. So you're tempted to say, oh, half the mass, I get half the velocity. Wrong. You're tempted. I didn't say it was right. I said you were tempted. Okay? Now here's the problem. It's underneath the radical. So you could so you can write this as one half the mass, right? Over R. Because that's what you would do, right? Yeah. So what can you do here? Take the little half out. So you could rewrite that as the square root of one half times square root of gm over r. So you could either write it as, but if you want, if you like decimals, if you take the square root of one half, it's like 0.7 something. Seven one. <coughs> okay. So yeah, you could say it's either you can either really say. It's Time's rational. the square root of one half as much. You could put one over the square root of two. You could put 0 0.707. Just don't say it's going to be half the square, square root of two over two. Now, what if I doubled the mass of the planet? It's illegal, though. It's illegal, though. Square root of two. Then it would increase by the square root of two. If I actually wanted to double the velocity of the planet, four. I'd have to increase the mass by a factor of four. 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 Okay. Four. Or I could change the universal gravitational constant, which isn't likely. Oh, uh, okay. Let me hand out stuff for the test. So stop that. Stop it. Stop it. Stop. Okay. So on that review, there's one problem that I don't want you to worry about, and that's on the centripetal part, motion part of it. It has to deal with Bubba in a barrel. I think it's like number six on the back side. Bubba. Bubba in a barrel. Uh, a barrel a under the water. So it's, what, it's the ride, if you've ever seen it in Kansas City, where they get the barrel spinning and they drop out the floor. And oh, yeah. you're stuck up there. Uh, so here's, stand on the wall. even though yeah. I'm not going to ask you about it, but the short version on how it works is, I had it. I've been throwing stuff around all day. I'll just use this. So, basically, you don't have to do this. I'm just showing you this is a demo. So, if I spin this around, I'm going to spin around in a horizontal circle. Oh, wait, careful with the TV. Yeah, yeah. So, now if I'm going to come out, but if I slow down, notice it begins to fall. Okay. What? <laughs> Dude, that was like within an inch. No, it wasn't. Like a no. big, heavy, just Bergen, go to the end. No, 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 I'm fine. I want to do the camera. You give everybody a guess. Okay. Nice. Turn the camera around. <laughs> oh, fuck. Okay. I'm going to need this video. I, 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 I live on the edge, man. Please, okay. please. So, is this please thing smack smack around, around, right? It's up there. But if I slow down, it It falls. So, what's happening is that the frictional force between this platform and is more than the gravitational force acting down. Yep. But as I slow down, what happens to the amount of that centripetal force? Decreases. It decreases. It decreases. So that's like, initially, you're pushing your hands together really, really hard, and there's a lot of friction, okay? But if you, light, if you lighten up that pressure, there's not much. So as I slow down, that frictional force decreases and becomes less than the gravitational force, and it begins to slide. 
So you don't have to do that problem. I just want to give you that visual. Make sure, make sure, make sure that you know what happens at the top of that circle versus what happens at the bottom of that circle. Okay? When do you add? When do you subtract? Okay? Keep in mind also what equations you have on your equation sheet. You don't have the idea that 4 is plus <coughs> per <coughs> equals FC plus FG at the bottom. That's something you just have to know. Oh, right, I'm going to add at the bottom, I'm going to subtract at the top. That force total, remember, is going to be what you experience. So I'm going to say, you're going to feel one-fourth your force weight, I half your force weight, something like that. So this becomes one-half like FG equals FC minus FG. So make sure that you add that over, masses cancel out. Make sure that you can understand that, okay? Beg of you, make sure that you understand those problems. Huge part of the text. Okay. Uh, what's the direction of any centripetal force? In towards the, towards the center. center. Inwards at right angles to the acceleration. I mean, the, the velocity. To the velocity. You got <laughs> that should mean every variable. Wait, yeah. Now, let's talk about a couple situations. Force. 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 Let's say yeah, that we're going to have <laughs> this binder clip. <laughs> Going around like this. What are the forces acting on that binder clip? Force gravity, gravity. force normal, force centripetal. Yeah. Yeah, what he said. So you got gravity, the normal, and what else? Centripetal. Now, what's creating the centripetal force? Friction. Friction. Yeah. So you can sit there and go yeah. mu equals force friction over I like that. force, force normal. normal. But then for the force friction, you substitute in force, 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 centripetal. force centripetal for Fn because you're on a flat surface, Fg. that is. Fg. So this is mass times your centripetal acceleration, that's Mg. So on a flat surface, it works, mu works out to be the ratio of your centripetal acceleration to your gravitational acceleration. Yay. There are some problems like that involving a record player, okay, and things going around like that. Pay attention to those, okay. Pay attention to those. Remember that you could either have, like for example, you could have V equals 2 pi R over T. You could also write that as 2 pi R times frequency. Okay? Because remember, period and frequency are inverses of each other. Okay? We won't get those, right? Equations like that? <laughs> <laughs> this one? 2 pi R over T? No. Wait, okay. so what? So the acceleration is just um, d squared over r? So what you have on your sheet I thought it was that's, t squared. That's, yeah, Wait, that's I thought it was t squared. is v squared over r. Yeah. Yeah. Squared, though. But if you substitute it's that in, then that becomes that 4 pi squared r over t squared. T squared. T squared. Isn't the top one t squared, though? <laughs> Isn't it 2 pi r over t squared? No, no, no. If it's just velocity. Because if you divide it by t squared, then you'd have meters per second squared. Yeah. That's why you get the force used more. <laughs> yeah. Swear it was t squared. No. Yeah. No. Promise you. No. Never. Because the units don't work out. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess because it's second. But squared. remember, you could also write that as 4 pi squared r times n squared. F squared. frequency squared. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. So, pop. So, on the, the circle one. Yeah. Are you only going to ask this like when it's at the very top of the Yeah, I'll either ask it either okay. in the extremes. Either you at the top or at the like bottom. Add, add or subtract if it's like not at the very top or the very bottom. Yeah, yeah. it's either I it will either be one of the extremes, top or bottom. Okay. Subtract. And like I said, and I promise you the top it's it's gonna be a, it's gonna be like a string type of ball where you're gonna have the mass of that ball and you have to find the tension and I'm gonna ask you, here's the first thing I'm gonna ask you is to just draw all the forces acting on the system. And there's only going to be two. Gravity pulling it down and the tension on that string acting up like that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Promise you. I, if you hand in that test and you haven't done a problem like this, you have done something wrong. Louis. So when it's moving uh, sh straight like that, will, there, will the tension always equal centripetal? 
Only in the horizontal plane will the tension equal the centripetal okay. force. Okay? If you're moving in this, you have tension and you have the centripetal force. If oh, you're at the yeah. Bottom, like, like, I mean, you don't have to do the, the triangle or whatever. No, 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 no. Okay. No, no, no. Only, and I, it will only be like something like that triangle one is going to be, it's going to be something like this. Okay? Where you're going to have out here, you've got the gravity acting down and the tension of the strain. But then you're going to have to find these other sides of that triangle. Uh -huh. Okay? Promise you. Promise you. Promise you. Pop. So whenever you're doing the circle like this, if centripetal is like always... Like this? Yeah, if centripetal is always acting inward, yep. then why at the top do you add them? Because no, it's no, really no, 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 no. You subtract, you subtract at the I mean, top. Yeah, at the it. top. Why do you subtract them then if they're both acting in the same direction? Because, let's say, for example, I make this thing swing around and I and I, I can shut off gravity. Uh -huh. Okay? So let's say that that needs 10 newtons of force to complete that circle. Mm -hmm. Okay? If and, and if there's no gravity, the string has to provide all of that. Okay? okay? Yeah. Now, let's say I turn gravity back on. And gravity is pulling down with the force of 8 newtons. So the string only has to make up the difference of the oh, 2 okay. newtons. Yeah. Okay? So the total... Yeah, that's the total is still 10. Yeah. Okay? But, you, it's both but gravity is providing part of them it. Combined equal because yes. Yes. Yeah, the centripetal is 90 degrees, right? And it's providing yeah. the acceleration that keeps it turning. Uh -huh. It's yeah. not an actual yeah. force pointing down. Uh -huh. Beckham, I'll get you that lecture from tomorrow. Right, Make sure that you watch that. Yeah. But he okay. wasn't here yesterday. Oh no. Yeah. But we'll get it. Okay. So yeah, tomorrow oh, for those of you that are traveling from Southeast tomorrow, well, it is Friday, so there's no you don't have to worry about anything after school. But yeah, it tomorrow's test. If you've never studied for a test, this one you might consider. I will give you the Swiss Army knife equation. Okay, I will give you that one. And then we have the yellow sheet, which has the other gravity ones on it, right? Actually, out of the goodness of my heart, I'm going to give you three gravity equations. Yeah. The Swiss Army Knife one, the one for velocity, and the one for little g. Little yeah. g is big the top g guns? Yeah. Didn't they give us the big dogs? Uh, and the big dogs. But I'm telling you, but those three equations aren't on the big dog, but I'll get them too. And then we have to know the, that one old guy's one, the like the R, the R cubed T, T square here. Kepler's, Kepler's third law. Yeah. It might be handy. You can solve for it, though. Yeah, you can solve for it if you just set up set up a ratio of the army knife. You can solve for it. Because oh, okay. if you, you set it up as a ratio, you see that it's R cubed over R cubed equals T squared over T squared. Um, yeah. Okay. That's so, so that's what's going on. All right, kids. <laughs> Go home. Go home. <laughs>